Chapter Thirty Five of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Five. Containing the unsatisfactory result of Oliver's adventure and a conversation of some importance between Harry Maylie and Rose. When the inmates of the house, attracted by Oliver's cries, hurried to the spot from which they proceeded, they found him pale and agitated, pointing in the direction of the meadows behind the house, and scarcely able to articulate the words, "'The Jew! The Jew!' Mr. Giles was at a loss to comprehend what this outcry meant, but Harry Maylie, whose perceptions were something quicker, and who had heard Oliver's history from his mother, understood it at once. "'What direction did he take?' he asked, catching up a heavy stick which was standing in a corner. "'That,' replied Oliver, pointing out the course the man had taken. "'I missed them in an instant.' "'Then they are in the ditch,' said Harry. "'Follow, and keep as near me as you can.' So saying, he sprang over the hedge, and darted off with a speed which rendered it a matter of exceeding difficulty for the others to keep near him. Giles followed as well as he could, and Oliver followed too, and in the course of a minute or two, Mr. Losburn, who had been out walking, and just then returned, tumbled over the hedge after them, and picking himself up with more agility than he could have been supposed to possess, struck into the same course at no contemptible speed shouting all the while, most prodigiously, to know what was the matter. On they all went, nor stopped they once to breathe, until the leader, striking off into an angle of the field indicated by Oliver, began to search narrowly, the ditch and hedge adjoining, which afforded time for the remainder of the party to come up, and for Oliver to communicate to Mr. Losburn the circumstances that had led to so vigorous a pursuit. The search was all in vain. There were not even the traces of recent footsteps to be seen. They stood now on the summit of a little hill, commanding the open fields in every direction for three or four miles. There was a village in the hollow on the left, but in order to gain that, after pursuing the track Oliver had pointed out, the men must have made a circuit of open ground, which it was impossible they could have accomplished in so short a time. A thick wood skirted the meadowland in another direction but they could not have gained that covert for the same reason. "'It must have been a dream, Oliver,' said Harry Maylie. "'Oh, no, indeed, sir,' replied Oliver, shuddering at the very recollection of the old wretch's countenance. "'I saw him too plainly for that. I saw them both, as plainly as I see you now.' "'Who was the other?' inquired Harry and Mr. Losburn together. The very same man I told you of, who came so suddenly upon me at the inn," said Oliver. We had our eyes fixed full upon each other, and I could swear to him. "'They took this way,' demanded Harry. "'Are you sure?' "'As I am, that the men were at the window,' replied Oliver, pointing down as he spoke to the hedge which divided the cottage garden from the meadow. "'The tall man! leapt over just there, and the Jew, running a few paces to the right, crept through that gap." The two gentlemen watched Oliver's earnest face as he spoke, and looking from him to each other, seemed to feel satisfied of the accuracy of what he said. Still, in no direction were there any appearances of the trampling of men and hurried flight. The grass was long, but it was trodden down nowhere, save where their own feet had crushed it. The sides and brinks of the ditches were of damp clay, but in no one place could they discern the print of men's shoes, or the slightest mark which would indicate that any feet had pressed the ground for hours before. "'This is strange,' said Harry. "'Strange?' echoed the doctor. "'Blathers and Duff themselves could make nothing of it.' Notwithstanding the evidently useless nature of their search, they did not desist until the coming on of night rendered its further prosecution hopeless, and even then they gave it up with reluctance. Giles was dispatched to the different alehouses in the village, furnished with the best description Oliver could give of the appearance and dress of the strangers. Of these, 
the Jew was, at all events, sufficiently remarkable to be remembered, supposing he had been seen drinking or loitering about, but Giles returned without any intelligence, calculated to dispel or lessen the mystery. On the next day, fresh search was made, and the inquiries renewed, but with no better success. On the day following, Oliver and Mr. Maylie repaired to the market town, in the hope of seeing or hearing something of the men there, but this effort was equally fruitless. After a few days, the affair began to be forgotten, as most affairs are, when wonder, having no fresh food to support it, dies away of itself. Meanwhile, Rose was rapidly recovering. She had left her room, was able to go out, and mixing once more with the family, carried joy into the hearts of all. But, although this happy change had a visible effect on the little circle, and although cheerful voices and merry laughter were once more heard in the cottage, there was at times an unwonted restraint upon some there, even upon Rose herself, which Oliver could not fail to remark. Mrs. Maylie and her son were often closeted together for a long time, and more than once Rose appeared with traces of tears upon her face. After Mr. Losburn had fixed a day for his departure to Chertsey, these symptoms increased, and it became evident that something was in progress which affected the peace of the young lady and of somebody else besides. At length, one morning, when Rose was alone in the breakfast parlour, Harry Maylie entered, and, with some hesitation, begged permission to speak with her for a few moments. "'A few, a very few, will suffice, Rose,' said the young man, drawing his chair towards her. "'What I shall have to say has already presented itself to your mind. The most cherished hopes of my heart are not unknown to you, though from my lips you have not heard them stated." Rose had been very pale, from the moment of his entrance, but that night had been the effect of her recent illness. She merely bowed, and bending over some plants that stood near, waited in silence for him to proceed. "'I—I I ought to have left here before,' said Harry. "'You should, indeed,' replied Rose. Forgive me for saying so, but I wish you had." "'I was brought here by the most dreadful and agonizing of all apprehensions,' said the young man. "'The fear of losing the one dear being on whom my every wish and hope are fixed. You had been dying, trembling between earth and heaven. We know that when the young, the beautiful and good, are visited with sickness, their pure spirits insensibly turn towards their bright home of lasting rest. We know, heaven help us, that the best and fairest of our kind too often fade in blooming." There were tears in the eyes of the gentle girl, as these words were spoken, and when one fell upon the flower over which she bent, and glistened brightly in its cup, making it more beautiful, it seemed as though the outpouring of her fresh young heart claimed kindred naturally with the loveliest things in nature. "'A creature,' continued the young man passionately, "'a creature as fair and innocent of guile as one of God's own angels fluttered between life and death. Oh, who could hope, when the distant world to which she was to kin, half open to her view, that she would return to the sorrow and calamity of this? Rose, Rose, to know that you were passing away like some soft shadow, which a light from above casts upon the earth, to have no hope that you would be spared to those who linger here, hardly to know a reason why you should be, to feel that you belong to that bright sphere whither so many of the fairest and the best have winged their early flight. And yet to pray, amid all these consolations, that you might be restored to those who loved you. These were distractions almost too great to bear. They were mine, by day and night, and with them came such a rushing torrent of fears and apprehensions and selfish regrets, lest you should die, and never know how devotedly I loved you, as almost bore down sense and reason in its course. You recovered, day by day, and almost hour by hour, some drop of health came back and mingling with the spent and feeble stream of life which circulated languidly within you, swelled it again 
to a high and rushing tide. I have watched you change, almost from death to life, with eyes that turn blind with their eagerness and deep affection. Do not tell me that you wish I had lost this, for it has softened my heart to all mankind. I did not mean that, said Rose, weeping. I only wish you had left here, that you might have turned to high and noble pursuits again, to pursuits well worthy of you. There is no pursuit more worthy of me, more worthy of the highest nature that exists, than the struggle to win such a heart as yours," said the young man, taking her hand. "'Rose, my own dear Rose, for years, for years I have loved you, hoping to win my way to fame, and then come home proudly and tell you it had been pursued only for you to share, thinking in my daydreams how I would remind you in that happy moment of the many silent tokens I had given of a boy's attachment, and claim your hand as in redemption of some old mute contract that had been sealed between us. That time has not arrived, but here, with not fame won, and no young vision realised, I offer you the heart so long your own, and stake my all upon the words with which you greet the offer. Your behaviour has ever been kind and noble," said Rose, mastering the emotions by which she was agitated, as you believe that I am not insensible or ungrateful. So hear my answer. It is that I may endeavour to deserve you. It is, dear Rose. It is, replied Rose, that you must endeavour to forget me, not as your old and dearly attached companion, for that would wound me deeply but as the object of your love. Look into the world. Think how many hearts you would be proud to gain are there. Confide some other passion to me, if you will. I will be the truest, warmest, and most faithful friend you have." There was a pause, during which Rose, who had covered her face with one hand, gave free vent to her tears. Harry still retained the other. "'And your reasons, Rose?' he said at length in a low voice, "'Your reasons for this decision?' "'You have a right to know them,' rejoined Rose. "'You can say nothing to alter my resolution. It is a duty that I must perform. I owe it, alike to others and to myself.' "'To yourself?' "'Yes, Harry. I owe it to myself that I, a friendless, portionless girl, with a blight upon my name, should not give your friends reason to suspect that I had sordidly yielded to your first passion, and fastened myself, a clog, on all your hopes and projects. I owe it to you and yours, to prevent you from opposing, in the warmth of your generous nature, this great obstacle to your progress in the world. "'If your inclinations chime with your sense of duty,' Harry began, "'they do not.' replied Rose, colouring deeply. "'Then you return, my love,' said Harry. "'Say but that, dear Rose, say but that, and soften the bitterness of this hard disappointment. If I could have done so, without doing heavy wrong to him I loved,' rejoined Rose, "'I could have—' "'Have received this declaration very differently,' said Harry. "'Do not conceal that from me at least, Rose.' I could," said Rose. Stay," she added, disengaging her hand. Why should we prolong this painful interview? Most painful to me, and yet productive of lasting happiness notwithstanding. For it will be happiness to know that I once held the high place in your regard, which I now occupy. And every triumph you achieve in life will animate me with new fortitude and firmness. Farewell, Harry. As we have met to-day, we meet no more, but in other relations than those in which this conversation have placed us. We may be long and happily entwined, and may every blessing that the prayers of a true and earnest heart can call down from the source of all truth and sincerity cheer and prosper you. 
"'Another word, Rose,' said Harry. "'Your reason, in your own words, from your own lips. Let me hear it.' "'The prospect before you,' answered Rose firmly, "'is a brilliant one. All the honours to which great talents and powerful connections can help men in public life are in store for you. But those connections are proud, and I will neither mingle with such as may hold in scorn the mother who gave me life, nor bring disgrace or failure on the son of her who has so well supplied that mother's place. In a word," said the young lady, turning away as her temporary firmness forsook her, "'there is a stain upon my name which the world visits on innocent heads. I will carry it into no blood but my own, and the reproach shall rest alone on me." One word more, Rose. Dearest Rose, one more, cried Harry, throwing himself before her. If I had been less, less fortunate, the world would call it, if some obscure and peaceful life had been my destiny. If I had been poor, sick, helpless, would you have turned from me then? Or has my probable advancement to riches and honour given this scruple birth?" "'Do not press me to reply,' answered Rose. "'The question does not arise, and never will. It is unfair, almost unkind, to urge it.' "'If your answer be what I almost dare to hope it is,' retorted Harry, it will shed a gleam of happiness upon my lonely way, and light the path before me. It is not an idle thing to do so much by the utterance of a few brief words, for one who loves you beyond all else. Oh, Rose, in the name of my ardent and enduring attachment, in the name of all I have suffered for you, and all you doom me to undergo, answer me this one question. "'Then, if your lot had been differently cast,' rejoined Rose, "'if you had been even a little, but not so far above me, "'if I could have been a help and comfort to you, "'in any humble scene of peace and retirement, "'and not a blot and drawback in ambitious and distinguished crowds, "'I should have been spared this trial. "'I have every reason to be happy, very happy now. "'But then, Harry, I own... I should have been happier." Busy recollections of old hopes, cherished as a girl long ago, crowded into the mind of Rose while making this avowal. But they brought tears with them, as old hopes will when they come back withered, and they relieved her. "'I cannot help this weakness, and it makes my purpose stronger,' said Rose, extending her hand. "'I must leave you now, indeed. "'I ask one promise,' said Harry, "'once, and only once more. Say, within a year, but it may be much sooner, I may speak to you again on this subject, for the last time.' "'Not to press me to alter my right determination,' replied Rose, with a melancholy smile. "'It will be useless.' "'No,' said Harry, "'to hear you repeat it, if you will.' Finally repeat it. I will lay at your feet whatever of station of fortune I may possess, and if you still adhere to your present resolution, will not seek, by word or act, to change it." "'Then let it be so,' rejoined Rose. "'It is but one pang the more, and by that time I may be enabled to bear it better.' She extended her hand again, but the young man caught her to his bosom and imprinting one kiss on her beautiful forehead, hurried from the room. End of chapter 35「Chapter 36 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens – Chapter 36 – is a very short one and may appear of no great importance in its place, but it should be read notwithstanding, as a sequel to the last, and a key to one that will follow when its time arrives. "'And so you are resolved to be my travelling companion this morning, eh?' said the doctor, as Harry Maylie joined him and Oliver at the breakfast-table. 
"'Why, you are not in the same mind or intention two half-hours together.' "'You will tell me a different tale one of these days,' said Harry, colouring without any perceptible reason. "'I hope I may have good cause to do so,' replied Mr. Losburn. "'Though I confess, I don't think I shall. But yesterday morning you had made up your mind, in a great hurry, to stay here, and to accompany your mother, like a dutiful son, to the seaside. Before noon you announced that you were going to do me the honour of accompanying me, as far as I go, on your road to London.' and at night you urge me, with great mystery, to start before the ladies are stirring, the consequence of which is that young Oliver here is pinned down to his breakfast when he ought to be ranging the meadows after botanical phenomena of all kinds. Too bad, isn't it, Oliver?" "'I should have been very sorry not to have been at home when you and Mr. Maylie went away, sir,' rejoined Oliver. "'That's a fine fellow,' said the doctor. "'You shall come and see me when you return. but." to speak seriously, Harry, has any communication from the great knobs produced this sudden anxiety on your part to be gone?" "'The great knobs,' replied Harry, under which designation I presume you include my most stately uncle, have not communicated with me at all since I have been here, nor at this time of the year is it likely that anything would occur to render necessary my immediate attendance among them." Well said the doctor. You are a queer fellow. But, of course, they will get you into Parliament at the election before Christmas, and these sudden shiftings and changes are no bad preparation for political life. There's something in that. Good training is always desirable, whether the race be for place, cup, or sweepstakes." Harry Maylie looked as if he could have followed up this short dialogue by one or two remarks that would have staggered the doctor not a little but he contented himself with saying, "'We shall see,' and pursued the subject no farther. The post-chaise drove up to the door shortly afterwards, and Giles coming in for the luggage, the good doctor bustled out to see it packed. "'Oliver,' said Harry Maylie in a low voice, "'let me speak a word with you.' Oliver walked into the window recess to which Mr. Maylie beckoned him, much surprised at the mixture of sadness and boisterous spirits which his whole behaviour displayed. "'You can write well now,' said Harry, laying his hand upon his arm. "'I hope so, sir,' replied Oliver. "'I shall not be at home again, perhaps for some time. I wish you would write to me, say, once a fortnight, every alternate Monday, to the General Post Office in London, will you?' "'Oh, certainly, sir. I should be proud to do it,' exclaimed Oliver, greatly delighted with the commission. "'I should like to know how—how my mother and Miss Maylie are,' said the young man, "'and you can fill up a sheet by telling me what walks you take, and what you talk about, and whether she—they, I mean, seem happy and and quite well. You understand me?' "'Oh, quite, sir, quite.' replied Oliver. "'I would rather you did not mention it to them,' said Harry, hurrying over his words, "'because it it, it might make my mother anxious to write to me oftener, and it is a trouble and a worry to her. Let it be a secret between you and me, and mind you tell me everything. I depend upon you.' Oliver, quite elated and honoured by a sense of his importance, faithfully promised to be secret and explicit in his communications. Mr. Maylie took leave of him, with many assurances of his regard and protection. The doctor was in the chaise. Giles, who it had been arranged should be left behind, held the door open in his hand, and the women servants were in the garden looking on. Harry cast one slight glance at the latticed window, and jumped into the carriage. "'Drive on!' he cried. "'Hard! Fast! Full gallop! Nothing short of flying will keep pace with me to-day!' "'Hello!' cried the doctor, letting down the front glass in a great hurry, and shouting to the postillion, "'Something very short of flying will keep pace with me, do you hear?' Jingling and clattering, till distance rendered its noise inaudible, and its rapid progress only perceptible to the eye, the vehicle wound its way along the road, almost hidden in a cloud of dust, now wholly disappearing, and now becoming visible again, as intervening objects, or the intricacies of the way, permitted. It was not until even the dusty cloud was no longer to be seen, that the gazers dispersed. 
and there was one looker-on, who remained with eyes fixed upon the spot where the carriage had disappeared, long after it was many miles away. For behind the white curtain, which had shrouded her from view, when Harry raised his eyes towards the window, sat Rose herself. "'He seems in high spirits and happy,' she said at length. "'I feared for a time he might be otherwise. I was mistaken. I am very, very glad.' Tears are signs of gladness as well as grief, but those which coursed down Rose's face, as she sat pensively at the window, still gazing in the same direction, seemed to tell more of sorrow than of joy. End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty Seven. In which the reader may perceive a contrast, not uncommon in matrimonial cases. Mr. Bumble sat in the workhouse parlour, with his eyes moodily fixed on the cheerless grate, whence, as it was summer time, no brighter gleam proceeded than the reflection of a certain sickly rays of the sun, which were sent back from its cold and shining surface. A paper fly-cage dangled from the ceiling, to which he occasionally raised his eyes in gloomy thought, and, as the heedless insects hovered round the gaudy network, Mr. Bumble would heave a deep sigh, while a more gloomy shadow overspread his countenance. Mr. Bumble was meditating. It might be that the insects brought to mind some painful passage in his own past life. Nor was Mr. Bumble's gloom the only thing calculated to awaken a pleasing melancholy in the bosom of a spectator. There were not wanting other appearances, and those closely connected with his own person, which announced that a great change had taken place in the position of his affairs. The laced coat, and the cocked hat—where were they? He still wore knee-breeches, and dark cotton stockings on his nether limbs, but they were not THE breeches. The coat was wide-skirted, and in that respect like THE coat, but oh, how different! The mighty cocked hat was replaced by a modest round one. Mr. Bumble was no longer a beadle. There are some promotions in life which, independent of the more substantial rewards they offer, require peculiar value and dignity from the coats and waistcoats connected with them. A field-marshal has his uniform, a bishop his silk apron, a counsellor his silk gown, a beadle his cocked hat. Strip the bishop of his apron, or the beadle of his hat and lace, what are they? Men. Mere men. Dignity, and even holiness, too, sometimes are more questions of coat and waistcoat than some people imagine. Mr. Bumble had married Mrs. Corney, and was master of the workhouse. Another beadle had come into power. On him the cocked hat gold-laced coat and staff, had all three descended. "'And to-morrow, two months it was done,' said Mr. Bumble, with a sigh. "'It seems a age.' Mr. Bumble might have meant that he had concentrated a whole existence of happiness into the short space of eight weeks. But the sigh—there was a vast deal of meaning in the sigh. "'I sold myself,' said Mr. Bumble, pursuing the same train of reflection. For six teaspoons, a pair of sugar-tongs, and a milk-pot, with a small quantity of second-hand furniture, and twenty pound in money. I went very reasonable. Cheap. Dirt cheap." "'Cheap!' cried a shrill voice in Mr. Bumble's ear. "'You would have been dear at any price. And dear enough I paid for you. Lord above knows that!' Mr. Bumble turned, and encountered the face of his interesting consort who, imperfectly comprehending the few words she had overheard of his complaint, had hazarded the foregoing remark at a venture. "'Mrs. Bumble, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, with a sentimental sternness. "'Well,' cried the lady, "'have the goodness to look at me,' said Mr. Bumble, fixing his eyes upon her. "'If she stands such a eye as that,' said Mr. Bumble to himself, "'she can stand anything. It is an eye I never knew to fail with paupers. If it fails with her, my power is gone. Whether an exceedingly small expansion of eye be sufficient to quell paupers, who, being lightly fed, are in no very high condition, 
or whether the late Mrs. Corney was particularly proof against eagle glances, are matters of opinion. The matter of fact is, that the matron was in no way overpowered by Mr. Bumble's scowl, but, on the contrary, treated it with great disdain, and even raised a laugh thereat, which sounded as though it were genuine. On hearing this most unexpected sound, Mr. Bumble looked, first incredulous, and afterwards amazed. He then relapsed into his former state, nor did he rouse himself until his attention was again awakened by the voice of his partner. "'Are you going to sit snoring there all day?' inquired Mrs. Bumble. "'I am going to sit here as long as I think proper, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'And although I was not snoring, I shall snore, gape, sneeze, laugh, or cry, as the humour strikes me, such being my prerogative.' "'Your prerogative,' sneered Mrs. Bumble, with ineffable contempt. "'I said the word, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble. "'The prerogative of a man is to command.' "'And what's the prerogative of a woman in the name of goodness?' cried the relict of Mr. Corney, deceased. "'To obey, ma'am,' thundered Mr. Bumble. "'Your late unfortunate husband should have taught it to you, and then perhaps he might have been alive now.' I wish he was, poor man." Mrs. Bumble, seeing at a glance that the decisive moment had now arrived, and that a blow struck for the mastership on one side or other, must necessarily be final and conclusive, no sooner heard this allusion to the dead and gone, than she dropped into a chair, and with a loud scream that Mr. Bumble was a hard-hearted brute, fell into a paroxysm of tears. But tears were not the things to find their way to Mr. Bumble's soul his heart was waterproof. Like washable beaver hats, that improve with rain, his nerves were rendered stouter and more vigorous by showers of tears, which, being tokens of weakness, and so far tacit admissions of his own power, pleased and exalted him. He eyed his good lady with looks of great satisfaction, and begged, in an encouraging manner, that she should cry her hardest, the exercise being looked upon by the faculty as strongly conducive to health. It opens the lungs, washes the countenance, exercises the eyes, and softens down the temper," said Mr. Bumble. So, cry away. As he discharged himself of this pleasantry, Mr. Bumble took his hat from a peg, and putting it on, rather rakishly, on one side, as a man might who felt he had asserted his superiority in a becoming manner, thrust his hands into his pockets and sauntered towards the door, with much ease and waggishness depicted in his whole appearance. Now, Mrs. Corney that was, had tried the tears, because they were less troublesome than a manual assault, but she was quite prepared to make trial of the latter mode of proceeding, as Mr. Bumble was not long in discovering. The first proof he experienced of the fact was conveyed in a hollow sound, immediately succeeded by the sudden flying off of his hat to the opposite end of the room. This preliminary proceeding, laying bare his head, the expert lady, clasping him tightly round the throat with one hand, inflicted a shower of blows, dealt with singular vigour and dexterity, upon it with the other. This done, she created a little variety by scratching his face, and tearing his hair, and, having by this time inflicted as much punishment as she deemed necessary for the offence, she pushed him over a chair, which was luckily well situated for the purpose and defied him to talk about his prerogative again, if he dared. "'Get up,' said Mrs. Bumble, in a voice of command, "'and take yourself away from here, unless you want me to do something desperate.' Mr. Bumble rose with a very rueful countenance, wondering much what something desperate might be. Picking up his hat, he looked towards the door. "'Are you going?' demanded Mrs. Bumble. "'Certainly, uh, my dear, certainly.' rejoined Mr. Bumble, making a quicker motion towards the door. "'I didn't intend to—I am going, my dear. You are so very violent that really I—' At this instant Mrs. Bumble stepped hastily forward to replace the carpet which had been kicked up in the scuffle. Mr. Bumble immediately darted out of the room, without bestowing another thought on his unfinished sentence, leaving the late Mrs. Corney in full possession of the field. Mr. Bumble was fairly taken by surprise and fairly beaten. He had a decided propensity for bullying, derived no inconsiderable pleasure 
from the exercise of petty cruelty, and consequently was, it is needless to say, a coward. This is by no means a disparagement to his character, for many official personages, who are held in high respect and admiration, are the victims of similar infirmities. The remark is made, indeed, rather in his favour than otherwise, and with a view of impressing the reader with a just sense of his qualifications for office. But the measure of his degradation was not yet full. After making a tour of the house, and thinking for the first time that the poor laws really were too hard on people, and that men who ran away from their wives, leaving them chargeable to the parish, ought, in justice, to be visited with no punishment at all, but rather rewarded as meritorious individuals who had suffered much. Mr. Mumble came to a room where some of the female paupers were usually employed in washing the parish linen, when the sound of voices in conversation now proceeded. <clears throat> said Mr. Bumble, summoning up all his native dignity. "'These women, at least, shall continue to respect the prerogative. Hello? Hello there? What do you mean by this noise, you hussies?' With these words, Mr. Bumble opened the door, and walked in with a very fierce and angry manner, which was at once exchanged for a most humiliated and cowering air, as his eyes unexpectedly rested on the form of his lady wife. "'My dear,' said Mr. Bumble, "'I didn't know you were here.' "'Didn't know I was here,' repeated Mrs. Bumble. "'What do you do here?' "'I thought they were talking rather too much to be doing their work properly, my dear.' replied Mr. Bumble, glancing distractedly at a couple of old women at the wash-tub, who were comparing notes of admiration at the workhouse-master's humility. "'You thought they were talking too much?' said Mrs. Bumble. "'What business is it of yours?' "'Why, uh, my dear,' urged Mr. Bumble submissively, "'what business is it of yours?' demanded Mrs. Bumble again. "'It's very true, your matron here, my dear.' submitted Mr. Bumble, but I thought you mightn't be in the way just then. "'I'll tell you what, Mr. Bumble,' returned his lady, "'we don't want any of your interference. You're a great deal too fond of poking your nose into things that don't concern you, making everybody in the house laugh the moment your back is turned, and making yourself look like a fool every hour in the day. Be off. Come.' Mr. Bumble, seeing with excruciating feelings, the delight of the two old paupers, who were tittering together most rapturously, hesitated for an instant. Mrs. Bumble, whose patience brooked no delay, caught up a bowl of soap-suds, and motioning him towards the door, ordered him instantly to depart, on pain of receiving the contents upon his portly person. What could Mr. Bumble do? He looked dejectedly round, and slunk away, and, as he reached the door, the titterings of the paupers broke into a shrill chuckle of irrepressible delight. It wanted but this. He was degraded in their eyes. He had lost caste and station before the very paupers. He had fallen from all the height and pomp of beadleship to the lowest depth of the most snubbed hen-peckery. "'All in two months,' said Mr. Bumble, filled with dismal thoughts. Two months! No more than two months ago!' I was not only my own master, but everybody else's, so far as the parochial workhouse was concerned. And now—' It was too much. Mr. Bumble boxed the ears of the boy who opened the gate for him, for he had reached the portal in his reverie, and walked distractedly into the street. He walked up one street, and down another, until exercise had abated the first passion of his grief, and then the revulsion of feeling made him thirsty. He passed a great many public-houses, but at length paused before one in a byway, whose parlour, as he gathered from a hasty peep over the blinds, was deserted, save by one solitary customer. It began to rain heavily at the moment. This determined him. Mr. Bumble stepped in, and ordering something to drink, as he passed the bar, entered the apartment at which he had looked from the street. The man who was seated there was tall and dark, and wore a large cloak. He had the air of a stranger, and seemed, by a certain haggardness in his look, as well as by the dusty soils on his dress, to have travelled some distance. He eyed Bumble askance, as he entered, but
but scarcely deigned to nod his head in acknowledgment of his salutation. Mr. Bumble had quite dignity enough for two, supposing even that the stranger had been more familiar. So he drank his gin and water, in silence, and read the paper with great show of pomp and circumstance. It so happened, however, as it will happen very often, when men fall into company under such circumstances, that Mr. Bumble felt, every now and then, a powerful inducement, which he could not resist, to steal a look at the stranger, and that whenever he did so, he withdrew his eyes, in some confusion, to find that the stranger was at that moment stealing a look at him. Mr. Bumble's awkwardness was enhanced by the very remarkable expression of the stranger's eye, which was keen and bright, but shadowed by a scowl of distrust and suspicion, unlike anything he had ever observed before, and repulsive to behold. When they had encountered each other's glance several times in this way, the stranger, in a harsh, deep voice, broke silence. "'Were you looking for me?' he said, when you peered in at the window. "'Not that I am aware of, unless your uh, Mr.' Here Mr. Bumble stopped short, for he was curious to know the stranger's name, and thought in his impatience he might supply the blank. "'I see you are not,' said the stranger, an expression of quiet sarcasm playing about his mouth, "'or you have known my name. You don't know it. I would recommend you not to ask for it.' "'I meant no harm, young man,' observed Mr. Bumble majestically. "'And have done none,' said the stranger. Another silence succeeded this short dialogue, which was again broken by the stranger. "'I have seen you before, I think,' said he. "'You were differently dressed at that time. And I only passed you in the street. But I should know you again. You were a beadle here once, were you not?' "'I was,' said Mr. Bumble, in some surprise, "'parochial beadle.' "'Just so,' rejoined the other, nodding his head. "'It was in that character I saw you. "'What are you now?' "'Master of the workhouse,' rejoined Mr. Bumble, slowly and impressively, to check any undue familiarity the stranger might otherwise assume. "'Master of the workhouse, young man.' "'You have the same eye to your own interest that you have always had, I doubt not,' resumed the stranger, looking keenly into Mr. Bumble's eyes as he raised them in astonishment at the question. "'Don't scruple to answer freely, man. I know you pretty well, you see.' "'I suppose a married man,' replied Mr. Bumble, shading his eyes with his hand, and surveying the stranger from head to foot in evident perplexity is not more averse to turning a honest penny, when he can, than a single one. Parochial officers are not so well paid that they can afford to refuse any little extra fee when it comes to them in a civil and proper manner." The stranger smiled, and nodded his head again, as much to say he had not mistaken his man, then rang the bell. "'Fill this glass again,' he said, handing Mr. Bumble's empty tumbler to the landlord. "'Let it be strong and hot. You like it so, I suppose?" Uh, "'Not too strong,' replied Mr. Bumble, with a delicate cough. "'You understand what that means, landlord?' said the stranger dryly. The host smiled, disappeared, and shortly afterwards returned with a steaming jorum, of which the first gulp brought the water into Mr. Bumble's eyes. "'Now listen to me,' said the stranger, after closing the door and window. I came down to this place to-day to find you out, and by one of those chances which the devil throws in the way of his friends, sometimes, you walked into the very room I was sitting in, while you were uppermost in my mind. I want some information from you. I don't ask you to give it for nothing, slight as it is. Put up that, to begin with." As he spoke, he pushed a couple of sovereigns across the table to his companion carefully, as though unwilling, that the chinking of money should be heard without. When Mr. Bumble had scrupulously examined the coins, to see that they were genuine, and had put them up with much satisfaction in his waistcoat pocket, he went on. "'Carry your memory back. Let me see. Twelve years last winter?' "'It's a long time,' said Mr. Bumble. "'Very good. 
I've done it. The scene, the workhouse. Good. And the time, night. Yes. And the place, the crazy hole, wherever it was, in which miserable drabs brought forth the life and health so often denied to themselves, gave birth to puling children for the parish to rear, and hid their shame, rot them in the grave. The lying in room, I suppose, said Mr. Bumble, not quite following the stranger's excited description. Yes, said the stranger, a boy was born there. A many boys, observed Mr. Bumble, shaking his head despondingly. A moraine on the young devils, cried the stranger. I speak of one, a meek-looking, pale-faced boy, who was apprenticed down here to a coffin-maker. I wish he had made his coffin and screwed his body in it, and afterwards ran away to London, as it was supposed. Why, you mean Oliver, young twist, said Mr. Bumble. I remember him, of course. There wasn't an obstinater young rascal. It's not of him I want to hear. I've heard enough of him, said the stranger, stopping Mr. Bumble in the outset of a tirade on the subject of poor Oliver's vices. It's of a woman, the hag that nursed his mother. Where is she? Where is she? said Mr. Bumble whom the gin and water had rendered facetious, it would be hard to tell. There's no midwifery there. Whichever place she's gone to, so I suppose she's out of employment anyway. "'What do you mean?' demanded the stranger sternly. "'That she died last winter,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. The man looked fixedly at him when he had given this information, and although he did not withdraw his eyes for some time afterwards, his gaze gradually became vacant and abstracted, and he seemed lost in thought. For some time he appeared doubtful whether he ought to be relieved or disappointed by the intelligence, but at length he breathed more freely, and withdrawing his eyes, observed that it was no great matter. With that he rose as if to depart. But Mr. Bumble was cunning enough, and he at once saw that an opportunity was opened for the lucrative disposal of some secret in the possession of his better half. He well remembered the night of old Sally's death, which the occurrences of that day had given him good reason to recollect, as the occasion on which he had proposed to Mrs. Corney. And although that lady had never confided to him the disclosure of which she had been the solitary witness, he had heard enough to know that it related to something that had occurred in the old woman's attendance, as workhouse nurse, upon the young mother of Oliver Twist. Hastily calling this circumstance to mind, he informed the stranger, with an air of mystery, that one woman had been closeted with the old Harridan shortly before she died, and that she could, as he had reason to believe, throw some light on the subject of his inquiry. "'How can I find her?' said the stranger, thrown off his guard, and plainly showing that all his fears, whatever they were, were aroused afresh by the intelligence. "'Only through me,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'When?' cried the stranger hastily. "'Tomorrow,' rejoined Bumble. "'At nine in the evening,' said the stranger, producing a scrap of paper, and writing down upon it an obscure address by the waterside, in characters that betrayed his agitation. "'At nine in the evening. Bring her to me there. I needn't tell you to be secret. It's your interest.' With these words, he led the way to the door, after stopping to pay for the liquor that had been drunk. Shortly remarking that their roads were different, he departed, without more ceremony than an emphatic repetition of the hour of appointment for the following night. On glancing at the address, the parochial functionary observed that it contained no name. The stranger had not gone far, so he made after him to ask it. "'What do you want?' cried the man, turning quickly round, as Bumble touched him on the arm. "'Following me?' "'Only to ask a question,' said the other, pointing to the scrap of paper. "'What name am I to ask for?' "'Monks,' rejoined the man, and strode hastily away. End of chapter 37
Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty Eight. Containing an account of what passed between Mr. and Mrs. Bumble and Mr. Monks at their nocturnal interview. It was a dull, close, overcast summer evening. The clouds, which had been threatening all day, spread out in a dense and sluggish mass of vapour, already yielded large drops of rain, and seemed to presage a violent thunderstorm, when Mr. and Mrs. Bumble, turning out of the main street of the town, directed their course towards a scattered little colony of ruinous houses, distant from it some mile and a half, or thereabouts, and erected on a low, unwholesome swamp bordering upon the river. They were both wrapped in old and shabby outer garments, which might, perhaps, serve the double purpose of protecting their persons from the rain, and sheltering them from observation. The husband carried a lantern, from which, however, no light yet shone, and trudged on a few paces in front, as though, the way being dirty, to give his wife the benefit of treading in his heavy footprints. They went on, in profound silence. Every now and then Mr. Bumble relaxed his pace, and turned his head, as if to make sure that his helpmate was following. Then, discovering that she was close at his heels, he mended his rate of walking, and proceeded, at a considerable increase of speed, towards their place of destination. This was far from being a place of doubtful character, for it had long been known as the residence of none but low ruffians, who, under various pretences of living by their labour, subsisted chiefly on plunder and crime. It was a collection of mere hovels, some hastily built with loose bricks, others of old worm-eaten ship timber, jumbled together without any attempted order or arrangement, and planted, for the most part, within a few feet of the river's bank. A few leaky boats, drawn up on the mud, and made fast to the dwarf wall which skirted it, and here and there an oar or coil of rope, appeared at first to indicate that the inhabitants of these miserable cottages pursued some avocation on the river. But a glance at the shattered and useless condition of the articles thus displayed would have led a passer-by, without much difficulty, to the conjecture that they were disposed there, rather for the preservation of appearances than with any view to their being actually employed. In the heart of this cluster of huts, and skirting the river, which its upper stories overhung, stood a large building, formerly used as a manufactory of some kind. It had, in its day, probably furnished employment to the inhabitants of the surrounding tenements, but it had long since gone to ruin. The rat, the worm, and the action of the damp had weakened and rotted the piles on which it stood, and a considerable portion of the building had already sunk down into the water while the remainder, tottering and bending over the dark stream, seemed to wait a favourable opportunity of following its old companion, and involving itself in the same fate. It was before this ruinous building that the worthy couple paused, as the first peal of distant thunder reverberated in the air, and the rain commenced pouring violently down. "'The place should be somewhere here,' said Bumble, consulting a scrap of paper he held in his hand. "'Hello there!' cried a voice from above. Following the sound, Mr. Bumble raised his head, and descried a man looking out of a door, breast-high, on the second story. "'Stand still a minute!' cried the voice. "'I'll be with you directly!' With which the head disappeared, and the door closed. "'Is that the man?' asked Mr. Bumble's good lady. Mr. Bumble nodded in the affirmative. "'Then mind what I told you,' said the matron, "'and be careful to say as little as you can, or you'll betray us at once.' Mr. Bumble, who had eyed the building with very rueful looks, was apparently about to express some doubts relative to the advisability of proceeding any further with the enterprise just then, when he was prevented by the appearance of monks, who opened a small door near which they stood, and beckoned them inwards. "'Come in,' he cried impatiently, stamping his foot upon the ground. "'Don't keep me here!' The woman, who had hesitated at first, walked boldly in, without any other invitation. Mr. Bumble, who was ashamed or afraid to lag behind, followed, obviously very ill at ease, and with scarcely any of that remarkable dignity which was usually his chief characteristic. "'What the devil made you stand lingering there in the wet?' 
said Monks, turning round and addressing Bumble, after he had bolted the door behind them. "'We, uh, we were only cooling ourselves,' stammered Bumble, looking apprehensively about him. "'Cooling yourselves?' retorted Monks. "'Not all the rain that ever fell or ever will fall will put as much of hell's fire out as a man can carry about with him. You won't cool yourself so easily, don't think it.' With this agreeable speech, Monks turned short upon the matron, and bent his gaze upon her, till even she, who was not easily cowed, was fain to withdraw her eyes, and turn them towards the ground. "'This is the woman, is it?' demanded Monks. "'Ahem. <clears throat> that is the woman.' replied Mr. Bumble, mindful of his wife's caution. "'You think women never can keep secrets, I suppose?' said the matron, interposing, and returning, as she spoke, the searching look of Monks. "'I know they will always keep one till it's found out,' said Monks. "'And what may that be?' asked the matron. "'The loss of their own good name,' replied Monks. "'So, by the same rule—' If a woman's a party to a secret that might hang or transport her, I'm not afraid of her telling it to anybody, not I. Do you understand, mistress?" No, rejoined the matron, slightly colouring as she spoke. Of course you don't, said Monks. How should you? Bestowing something halfway between a smile and a frown upon his two companions, and again beckoning them to follow him. The man hastened across the apartment, which was of considerable extent, but low in the roof. He was preparing to ascend a steep staircase, or rather ladder, leading to another floor of warehouses above, when a bright flash of lightning streamed down the aperture, and a peal of thunder followed, which shook the crazy building to its centre. "'Hear it!' he cried, shrinking back. "'Hear it! Rolling and crashing on as if—' echoed through a thousand caverns where the devils were hiding from it. I hate the sound." He remained silent for a few moments, and then, removing his hands suddenly from his face, showed, to the unspeakable discomposure of Mr. Bumble, that it was much distorted and discoloured. "'These fits come over me now and then,' said Monks, observing his alarm, "'and thunder sometimes brings them on. Don't mind me now. It's all over for this once.' Thus speaking, he led the way up the ladder, and hastily closing the window-shutter of the room into which it led, lowered a lantern which hung at the end of a rope and pulley, passed through one of the heavy beams in the ceiling, and which cast a dim light upon an old table and three chairs that were placed beneath it. "'Now,' said Monks, when they had all three seated themselves, "'the sooner we come to our business, the better for all. The woman knows what it is, does she?' The question was addressed to Bumble, but his wife anticipated the reply by intimating that she was perfectly acquainted with it. "'He is right in saying that you were with this hag the night she died, and that she told you something?' "'About the mother of the boy you named?' replied the matron, interrupting him. "'Yes.' "'The first question is, of what nature was her communication?' said Monks. "'That's the second observed the woman, with much deliberation. "'The first is, what may the communication be worth?' "'Who oh, the devil can tell that without knowing of what kind it is?' asked Monks. "'Nobody better than you, I am persuaded,' answered Mrs. Bumble, who did not want for spirit, as her yoke-fellow could abundantly testify. Huh, said Monks, significantly, and with a look of eager inquiry. "'There may be money's worth to get, eh?' "'Perhaps there may,' was the composed reply. "'Something that was taken from her,' said Monks. "'Something that she wore. "'Something that—you had better bid,' interrupted Mrs. Bumble. "'I've heard enough, already, to assure me that you are the man I ought to talk to.' Mr. Bumble, who had not yet been admitted by his better half into any greater share of the secret than he had originally possessed, listened to this dialogue with outstretched neck and distended eyes, which he directed towards his wife and monks, by turns, in undisguised astonishment, increased, if possible, when the latter sternly demanded what sum was required for the disclosure. "'Was it worth to you?' 
asked the woman, as collectedly as before. "'It may be nothing. It may be twenty pounds,' replied Monks. "'Speak out, and let me know which.' "'Add five pounds to the sum you've named. Give me five and twenty pounds in gold,' said the woman, "'and I'll tell you all I know. Not before.' Five and twenty pounds?' exclaimed Monks, drawing back. "'I spoke as plainly as I could,' replied Mrs. Bumble. "'It's not a large sum, either.' "'Not a large sum for a paltry secret that may be nothing when it's told.' cried Monks impatiently, and which has been lying dead for twelve years past or more. "'Such matters keep well, and, like good wine, often double their value in course of time,' answered the matron, still preserving the resolute indifference she had assumed. "'As a lying dead, there are those who will lie dead for twelve thousand years to come, or twelve million, for anything you or I know, who will tell strange tales at last.' "'What if I pay it for nothing?' asked Monks, hesitating. "'You can easily take it away again,' replied the matron. "'I am but a woman, alone here, and unprotected.' <clears throat> "'Not alone, my dear, nor unprotected neither,' submitted Mr. Bumble, in a voice tremulous with fear. "'I am here, my dear, and uh, besides,' said Mr. Bumble, his teeth chattering as he spoke. "'Mr. Monks is too much of a gentleman to attempt any violence on parochial persons. Mr. Monks is aware that I am not a young man, my dear, and also that I am a little run to seed, as I may say. But he has heard—I say I have no doubt Mr. Monks has heard, my dear, that I am a very determined officer, with very uncommon strength, if I am once roused.' I only want a little rousing, that's all." As Mr. Bumble spoke, he made a melancholy feint of grasping his lantern with fierce determination, and plainly showed, by the alarmed expression of every feature, that he did want a little rousing, and not a little, prior to making any very warlike demonstration, unless, indeed, against paupers, or other personal persons trained down for the purpose. "'You are a fool!' said Mrs. Bumble, in reply, and had better hold your tongue." "'He had better have it cut out before he came, if he can't speak in a lower tone,' said Monks, grimly. "'So, he's your husband, eh?' "'He? My husband!' tittered the matron, parrying the question. "'I thought as much when you came in,' rejoined Monks, marking the angry glance which the lady darted at her spouse as she spoke. "'So much the better. I have less hesitation in dealing with two people, when I find that there's only one will between them. I'm in earnest. See here." He thrust his hand into a side-pocket, and, producing a canvas bag, told out twenty-five sovereigns on the table, and pushed them over to the woman. "'Now,' he said, "'gather them up, and when this cursed peal of thunder, which I feel is coming up to break over the house-top, is gone, let's hear your story. The thunder, which seemed in fact much nearer, and to shiver and break almost over their heads, having subsided, Monks, raising his face from the table, bent forward to listen to what the woman should say. The faces of the three nearly touched, as the two men leant over the small table in their eagerness to hear, and the woman also leant forward to render her whisper audible. The sickly rays of the suspended lantern falling directly upon them aggravated the paleness and anxiety of their countenances, which, encircled by the deepest gloom and darkness, looked ghastly in the extreme. "'When this woman that we called old Sally died,' the matron began, "'she and I were alone.' "'Was there no one by?' asked Monks in the same hollow whisper. "'No sick wretch or idiot in some other bed? No one who could hear and might, by possibility, understand." "'Not a soul,' replied the woman. "'We were alone. I stood alone beside the body when death came over it.' "'Good,' said Monks, regarding her attentively. "'Go on.' "'She spoke of a young creature,' resumed the matron, "'who had brought a child into the world some years before, not merely in the same room, but in the same bed 
in which she then lay dying. Ay, said Monks, with quivering lip, and glancing over his shoulder, blood, how things come about. The child was the one you named to him last night, said the matron, nodding carelessly towards her husband. The mother, this nurse, had robbed. In life? asked Monks. In death, replied the woman, with something like a shudder. She stole from the corpse, when it had hardly turned no one, that which the dead mother had prayed her, with her last breath, to keep for the infant's sake. She sold it? cried Monks, with desperate eagerness. Did she sell it? Where? When? To whom? How long before? As she told me, with great difficulty, that she had done this, said the matron, she fell back and died. Without saying more? cried Monks, in a voice which, from its very suppression, seemed only the more furious. It's a lie. I'll not be played with. She said more. I'll tear the life out of you both, but I'll know what it is. She didn't utter another word, said the woman, to all appearance unmoved, as Mr. Bumble was very far from being, by the strange man's violence. But she clutched my gown, violently, with one hand, which was partly closed, and when I saw that she was dead, and so removed the hand by force, I found it clasped a scrap of dirty paper. "'Which contained?' interposed Monks, stretching forward. "'Nothing,' replied the woman. "'It was a pawnbroker's duplicate.' "'For what?' demanded Monks. "'In good time, I'll tell you,' said the woman. "'I judge that she had kept the trinket for some time, in the hope of turning it to better account, and then had pawned it and had saved or scraped together money to pay the pawnbroker's interest, year by year, and prevent its running out, so that if anything came of it, it could still be redeemed. Nothing had come of it, and, as I tell you, she died with a scrap of paper, all worn and tattered, in her hand. The time was out in two days. I thought something might one day come of it, too, and so redeemed the pledge." "'Where is it now?' asked Monks quickly. "'There,' replied the woman. And, as if glad to be relieved of it, she hastily threw upon the table a small kid-bag, scarcely large enough for a French watch, which Monks, pouncing upon, tore open with trembling hands. It contained a little gold locket, in which were two locks of hair, and a plain gold wedding-ring. "'It has the word Agnes,' engraved on the inside," said the woman. There is a blank left for the surname, and then follows the date which is within a year before the child was born. I found out that." "'And this is all?' said Monks, after a close and eager scrutiny of the contents of the little packet. "'All,' replied the woman. Mr. Bumble drew a long breath, as if he were glad to find that the story was over and no mention made of taking the five-and-twenty pounds back again. And now he took courage to wipe the perspiration which had been trickling over his nose, unchecked, during the whole of the previous dialogue. "'I know nothing of the story, beyond what I can guess at,' said his wife, addressing Monks, after a short silence. "'And I want to know nothing, for it's safer not. But I may ask you two questions, may I?' "'You may ask,' said Monks, with some show of surprise. But whether I answer or not, is another question." "'Which makes three, observed Mr. Bumble, essaying a stroke of facetiousness. "'Is that what you expected to get from me?' demanded the matron. "'It is,' replied Monks. "'The other question—' "'What do you propose to do with it? Can it be used against me?' "'Never,' rejoined Monks, "'nor against me either. See here. But don't move a step forward, or your life is not worth a bulrush." With these words, he suddenly wheeled the table aside, and pulling an iron ring in the boarding, threw back a large trap-door, which opened close at Mr. Bumble's feet, and caused that gentleman to retire several paces backward with great precipitation. 
"'Look down,' said Monks, lowering the lantern into the gulf. "'Don't fear me. I could have let you down quietly enough, when you were seated over it, if that had been my game.' Thus encouraged, the matron drew near to the brink, and even Mr. Bumble himself, impelled by curiosity, ventured to do the same. The turbid water, swollen by the heavy rain, was rushing rapidly on below, and all other sounds were lost in the noise of its plashing and eddying against the green and slimy piles. There had once been a water-mill beneath, the tide foaming and chafing round the few rotten stakes and fragments of machinery that yet remained, seemed to dart onward with a new impulse, when freed from the obstacles which had unavailingly attempted to stem its headlong course. If you flung a man's body down there, where would it be to-morrow morning?" said Monks, swinging the lantern to and fro in the dark well. Twelve miles down the river, and cut the pieces besides,' replied Bumble, recoiling at the thought. Monks drew the little packet from his breast, where he had hurriedly thrust it, and, tying it to a leaden weight, which had formed a part of some pulley, and was lying on the floor, dropped it into the stream. It fell straight and true as a die, clove the water with a scarcely audible splash, and was gone. The three, looking into each other's faces, seemed to breathe more freely. "'There,' said Monks, closing the trap-door, which fell heavily back into its former position, "'if the sea ever gives up its dead, as books say it will.' It will keep its gold and silver to itself, and that trash among it. We have nothing more to say, and may break up our pleasant party." "'By all means,' observed Mr. Bumble, with great alacrity. "'You'll keep a quiet tongue in your head, will you?' said Monks, with a threatening look. "'I am not afraid of your wife.' "'You may depend upon me, young man.' answered Mr. Bumble, bowing himself gradually towards the ladder, with excessive politeness, on everybody's account, uh, young man, on my own, you know, uh, Mr. Monks. "'I'm glad for your sake to hear it,' remarked Monks. "'Light your lantern, and get away from here as fast as you can.' It was fortunate that the conversation terminated at this point, or Mr. Bumble, who had bowed himself to within six inches of the ladder, would infallibly have pitched headlong into the room below. He lighted his lantern, from that which Monks had detached from the rope, and now carried in his hand, and making no effort to prolong the discourse, descended in silence, followed by his wife. Monks brought up the rear, after pausing on the steps to satisfy himself that there were no other sounds to be heard than the beating of the rain without, and the rushing of the water. They traversed the lower room, slowly and with caution, for Monks started at every shadow, and Mr. Bumble, holding his lantern a foot above the ground, walked not only with remarkable care, but with a marvellously light step for a gentleman of his figure, looking nervously about him for hidden trap-doors. The gate at which they had entered was softly unfastened and opened by monks, merely exchanging a nod with their mysterious acquaintance. The married couple emerged into the wet and darkness outside. They were no sooner gone than monks, who appeared to entertain an invincible repugnance to being left alone, called to a boy who had been hidden somewhere below. Bidding him go first and bear the light, he returned to the chamber he had just quitted. End of chapter 38「Chapter 39 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty Nine. Introduces some respectable characters with whom the reader is already acquainted, and shows how Monks and the Jew laid their worthy heads together. On the evening following that upon which the three worthies mentioned in the last chapter disposed of their little matter of business as therein narrated, Mr. William Sykes, awakening from a nap, drowsily growled forth an inquiry what time of night it was. The room in which Mr. Sykes propounded this question was not one of those he had tenanted, previous to the Chertsey expedition, although it was in the same quarter of the town, and was situated at no great distance from his former lodgings. 
It was not, in appearance, so desirable a habitation as his old quarters, being a mean and badly furnished apartment of very limited size, lighted only by one small window in the shelving roof, and abutting on a close and dirty lane. Nor were there wanting other indications of the good gentleman's having gone down in the world of late, for a great scarcity of furniture, and total absence of comfort, together with the disappearance of all such small movables as spare clothes and linen, bespoke a state of extreme poverty, while the meagre and attenuated condition of Mr. Sykes himself would have fully confirmed these symptoms if they had stood in any need of corroboration. The housebreaker was lying on the bed, wrapped in his white greatcoat, by way of dressing-gown, and displaying a set of features in no degree improved by the cadaverous hue of illness, and the addition of a soiled nightcap, and a stiff black beard of a week's growth. The dog sat at the bedside, now eyeing his master with a wistful look, and now pricking his ears, and uttering a low growl, as some noise in the street, or in the lower part of the house, attracted his attention. Seated by the window, busily engaged in patching an old waistcoat, which formed a portion of the robber's ordinary dress, was a female, so pale and reduced, with watching and privation, that there would have been considerable difficulty in recognising her as the same Nancy who has already figured in this tale, but for the voice in which she replied to Mr. Sykes's question. "'Not long gone seven, said the girl. "'How do you feel to-night, Bill?' "'As weak as water,' replied Mr. Sykes, with an imprecation on his eyes and limbs. "'Here, lend us a hand, and let me go off this thundering bed anyhow.' Illness had not improved Mr. Sykes's temper, for, as the girl raised him up, and led him to a chair, he muttered various curses on her awkwardness, and struck her. "'Whining, are you?' said Sykes. "'Come, don't stand in there. If you can't do anything better than that, cut off altogether. Do you hear me?' "'I hear you,' returned the girl, turning her face aside, and forcing a laugh. <laughs> "'What a fancy have you got in your head now?' "'Oh!' "'You've thought better of it, have you?' growled Sykes, marking the tear which trembled in her eye. "'All the better for you, you have.' "'Why, you don't mean to say you'd be hard upon me to-night, Bill?' said the girl, laying her hand upon his shoulder. "'No,' cried Mr. Sykes. "'Why not?' "'Such a number of nights,' said the girl, with a touch of woman's tenderness, which communicated something like sweetness of tone, even to her voice. Such a number of nights as I've been patient with you, nursing and caring for you, as if you'd been a child, and this the first that I've seen you like yourself. You wouldn't have served me as you did just now if you'd thought of that, would you? Come, come, say you wouldn't. Well, then, rejoined Mr. Sykes, I wouldn't. Why, damn, now the girl's whining again. It's nothing, said the girl, throwing herself into a chair. Don't you seem to mind me? It will soon be over. What will be over? demanded Mr. Sykes in a savage voice. What foolery are you up to now again? Get up and bustle about, and don't come over me with your woman's nonsense. At any other time, this remonstrance and the tone in which it was delivered would have had the desired effect. But the girl, being really weak and exhausted, dropped her head over the back of the chair and fainted before Mr. Sykes could get out a few of the appropriate oaths with which, on similar occasions, he was accustomed to garnish his threats. Not knowing very well what to do, in this uncommon emergency, for Miss Nancy's hysterics were usually of that violent kind which the patient fights and struggles out of, without much assistance, Mr. Sykes tried a little blasphemy, and finding that mode of treatment wholly ineffectual, called for assistance. "'What's the matter here, my dear?' said Fagin, looking in. "'Lend a hand to the girl, can't you?' replied Sykes impatiently. "'Don't stand chattering and grinning at me.' With an exclamation of surprise, Fagin hastened to the girl's assistance, while Mr. John Dawkins, otherwise the artful dodger, who had followed his venerable friend into the room, hastily deposited on the floor a bundle with which he was laden, and snatching a bottle from the grasp of Master Charles Bates, who came close at his heels, uncorked it in a twinkling with his teeth, and poured a portion of its contents down the patient's throat, previously taking a taste himself to prevent mistakes. "'Give her a whiff of fresh air with the bellows, Charlie,' said Mr. Dawkins, "'and you, slap her hands, Fagin, 
while Bill undoes the petticoats. These united restoratives, administered with great energy, especially that department consigned to Master Bates, who appeared to consider his share in the proceedings a piece of unexampled pleasantry, were not long in producing the desired effect. The girl gradually recovered her senses, and, staggering to a chair by the bedside, hid her face upon the pillow, leaving Mr. Sykes to confront the newcomers in some astonishment at their unlooked-for appearance. "'Why, what evil wind has blowed you here?' he asked Fagin. "'No evil wind at all, my dear, for evil winds blow nobody any good, and I brought something good with me that you'll be glad to see. Dodger, my dear, open the bundle, and give Bill the little trifles that we spent all our money on this morning.' In compliance with Mr. Fagin's request, the artful untied this bundle, which was of large size, and formed of an old tablecloth, and handed the articles it contained, one by one, to Charlie Bates, who placed them on the table with various encomiums on their rarity and excellence. "'Sit your rabbit pie, Bill!' exclaimed that young gentleman, disclosing to view a huge pasty. "'Sit delicate creatures with sit tender limbs, Bill, out of weary bones melt in your mouth, and there's no occasion to pick em. Half a pound of seven and sixpenny green. So precious strong that if you mix it with barley and water, it'll go night to blow the lid off a teapot. Off. A pound and a half of moist sugar that the niggers didn't work at at all afore they got it up to sitch a pitch of goodness. Oh no. Two half quartern brands, pound of best fresh, piece of double Gloucester, and to wind up all some of the richest sort you ever blushed. Uttering this last panegyric, Master Bates produced, from one of his extensive pockets, a full-sized wine-bottle, carefully corked, while Mr. Dawkins, at the same instant, poured out a wine-glassful of raw spirits from the bottle he carried, which the invalid tossed down his throat without a moment's hesitation. "'Ah!' said Fagin, rubbing his hands with great satisfaction. "'You'll do, Bill. You'll do now.' "'Do!' exclaimed Mr. Sykes. I might have been done for, twenty times over, afore you'd have done anything to help me. What do you mean by leaving a man in this state, three weeks and more, you false-hearted wagabond? Only hear him, boys, said Fagin, shrugging his shoulders, and us come to bring him all these beautiful things. The things is well enough in their way, observed Mr. Sykes, a little soothed, as he glanced over the table. But what have you got to say for yourself? Why you should leave me here, down in the mouth, health, blunt, and everything else, and take no more notice of me all this mortal time than if I was that ere dog? Drive him down, Charlie. I never see such a jolly dog as that, cried Master Bates, doing as he was desired, smelling the grub like an old lady a going to market. He'd make his fortune on the stage, that dog would, and revive the draymar besides. "'Hold your din!' cried Sykes, as the dog retreated under the bed, still growling angrily. "'What have you got to say for yourself, you withered old fence, eh?' "'I was away from London a week or more, my dear, on a plant,' replied the Jew. "'And what about the other fortnight?' demanded Sykes. "'What about the other fortnight, that you've left me lying here like a sick rat in his hole?' "'I couldn't help it, Bill. I can't go into a long explanation before the company, but I couldn't help it, upon my honour. "'Upon your what?' growled Sykes with excessive disgust. "'Yeah. Cut me off a piece of that pie, one of you boys, to take the taste of that out of my mouth or it'll choke me dead. "'Don't be out of temper, my dear,' urged Fagin submissively. "'I've never forgot you, Bill, never once. "'No, I'll pound it that you ain't," replied Sykes with a bitter grin. "'You've been scheming and plotting away every hour that I have laid shivering and burning here. "'And Bill was to do this, and Bill was to do that.' "'And Bill was to do it all dirt cheap, as soon as he got well, 
and was quite poor enough for your work. If it hadn't been for the girl, I might have died. Then now, Bill, remonstrated Fagin, eagerly catching at the word, if it hadn't been for the girl. Who but poor old Fagin was the means of your having such a handy girl about you? He says true enough there, said Nancy, coming hastily forward. Let him be, let him be. Nancy's appearance gave a new turn to the conversation, for the boys, receiving a sly wink from the wary old Jew, began to ply her with liquor, of which, however, she took very sparingly, while Fagin, assuming an unusual flow of spirits, gradually brought Mr. Sykes into a better temper, by affecting to regard his threats as a little pleasant banter, and, moreover, by laughing very heartily at one or two rough chokes, which, after repeated applications to the spirit-bottle, he condescended to make. "'It's all very well,' said Mr. Sykes, "'but I must have some blunt from you to-night.' "'I haven't a piece of coin about me,' replied the Jew. "'Then you've got lots at home,' retorted Sykes, "'and I must have some from there.' "'Lots!' cried Fagin, holding up his hands. "'I haven't so much as would—I don't know how much you've got, and I dare say you hardly know yourself, as it would take a pretty long time to count it,' said Sykes. "'But I must have some. Tonight. And that's flat.' "'Well, well,' said Fagin, with a sigh, "'I'll send Artful round presently. You won't do nothing of the kind,' rejoined Mr. Sykes. "'The Artful's a deal too Artful.' and will forget to come, or lose his way, or get dodged by traps, and so be perwented, or anything for an excuse if you put him up to it. Nancy shall go to the ken and fetch it, to make all sure, and I'll lie down and have a snooze while she's gone." After a deal of haggling and squabbling, Fagin beat down the amount of the required advance, from five pounds to three pounds four and sixpence protesting with many solemn asseverations that that would only leave him eighteen pence to keep house with, Mr. Sykes sullenly remarking that if he couldn't get any more, he must accompany him home, with the Dodger and Master Bates put the eatables in the cupboard. The Jew then, taking leave of his affectionate friend, returned homeward, attended by Nancy and the boys. Mr. Sykes, meanwhile, flinging himself on the bed, and composing himself to sleep away the time until the young lady's return. In due course they arrived at Fagin's abode, where they found Toby Crackett and Mr. Chitling intent upon their fifteenth game at cribbage, which it is scarcely necessary to say the latter gentleman lost, and with it his fifteenth and last sixpence, much to the amusement of his young friends. Mr. Crackett, apparently somewhat ashamed at being found relaxing himself with a gentleman so much his inferior in station, and mental endowments, yawned, and inquiring after Sykes, took up his hat to go. "'Has nobody been, Toby?' asked Fagin. "'Not a living leg,' answered Mr. Crackett, pulling up his collar. "'It's been as dull as swipes. You ought to stand something handsome, Fagin, to recompense me for keeping out so long. Damn!' I'm as flat as a juryman, and should have gone to sleep, as fast as Newgate, if I hadn't had the good nature to amuse this youngster. Horrid dull, I'm blessed if I ain't. With these and other ejaculations of the same kind, Mr. Toby Crackett swept up his winnings, and crammed them into his waistcoat pocket, with a haughty air, as though such small pieces of silver were wholly beneath the consideration of a man of his figure. This done, he swaggered out of the room with so much elegance and gentility, that Mr. Chitling, bestowing numerous admiring glances on his legs and boots till they were out of sight, assured the company that he considered his acquaintance cheap at fifteen sixpences at an interview, and that he didn't value his losses as the snap of his little finger. "'What a rum chap you are, Tom!' said Master Bates, highly amused by this declaration. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'How am I, Fagin?' "'A very clever fellow, my dear,' said Fagin, patting him on the shoulder, and winking to his other pupils. "'And Mr. Crackett is a heavy swell, ain't he, Fagin?' asked Tom. "'No doubt at all of that, my dear. And it is a creditable thing to have his acquaintance, ain't it, Fagin?' pursued Tom. 
"'Very much so, indeed, my dear. They're only jealous, Tom, because he won't give it to them.' "'Ah!' cried Tom triumphantly. "'That's where it is. He has cleaned me out. But I can go and earn some more when I like, can't I, Fagin?' "'To be sure you can. And the sooner you go, the better, Tom. So make up your loss at once, and don't lose any more time. Dodger, Charlie, it's time you were on the lay. Come, it's nearly ten, and nothing done yet." In obedience to this hint, the boys, nodding to Nancy, took up their hats and left the room. The Dodger and his vivacious friend indulging, as they went, in many witticisms at the expense of Mr. Chitling, in whose conduct it is but justice to say there was nothing very conspicuous or peculiar, inasmuch as there are a great number of spirited young bloods upon town, who pay a much higher price than Mr. Chitling for being seen in good society, and a great number of fine gentlemen, composing the good society aforesaid, who established their reputation upon very much the same footing as Flash Toby Crackett. "'Now,' said Fagin, when they had left the room, "'I'll go and get you that cash, Nancy. This is only the key of a little cupboard, where I keep a few odd things the boys get, my dear. I never lock up my money, <laughs> for I've got none to lock up, my dear. <laughs> "'None to lock up. It's a poor trade, Nancy, and no thanks. But I'm fond of seeing the young people about me, and I bear it all. I bear it all. Shh!' he said, hastily concealing the key in his breast. "'Who's that? Listen!' The girl, who was sitting at the table with her arms folded, appeared in no way interested in the arrival or to care whether the person, whoever he was, came or went, until the murmur of a man's voice reached her ears. The instant she caught the sound, she tore off her bonnet and shawl with the rapidity of lightning, and thrust them under the table. The Jew, turning round immediately afterwards, she muttered a complaint of the heat, in a tone of languor that contrasted very remarkably with the extreme haste and violence of this action, which, however, had been unobserved by Fagin, who had his back towards her at the time. He whispered, as though nettled by the interruption, "'It's the man I expected before. He's coming downstairs. Not a word about the money while he's here, Nance. He won't stop long. Not ten minutes, my dear.' Laying his skinny forefinger upon his lip, the Jew carried a candle to the door, as a man's step was heard upon the stairs without. He reached it at the same moment as the visitor, who, coming hastily into the room, was close upon the girl before he observed her. It was Monks. "'Only one of my young people,' said Fagin, observing that Monks drew back on beholding a stranger. "'Don't move, Nancy.' The girl drew closer to the table, and, glancing at Monks with an air of careless levity, withdrew her eyes. But as he turned towards Fagin, she stole another look, so keen and searching and full of purpose, that if there had been any bystander to observe the change, he could hardly have believed the two looks to have proceeded from the same person. "'Any news?' inquired Fagin. "'Great!' "'And, and, good?' asked Fagin, hesitating, as though he feared to vex the other man by being too sanguine. "'Not bad, anyway,' replied Monks with a smile. "'I've been prompt enough this time. Let me have a word with you.' The girl drew closer to the table and made no offer to leave the room, although she could see that Monks was pointing to her. The Jew, perhaps fearing she might say something aloud about the money if he endeavoured to get rid of her, pointed upward, and took Monks out of the room. "'Not that infernal hole we were in before,' she could hear the man say as they went upstairs. Fagin laughed, and making some reply which did not reach her, seemed, by the creaking of the boards, to lead his companion to the second story. Before the sound of their footsteps had ceased to echo through the house, the girl had slipped off her shoes, and drawing her gown loosely over her head, and muffling her arms in it, stood at the door, listening with breathless interest. The moment the noise ceased, she glided from the room, ascended the stairs with incredible softness and silence, 
and was lost in the gloom above. The room remained deserted for a quarter of an hour or more. The girl glided back, with the same unearthly tread, and immediately afterwards the two men were heard descending. Monks went at once into the street, and the Jew crawled upstairs again for the money. When he returned, the girl was adjusting her shawl and bonnet, as if preparing to be gone. "'Why, Nance!' exclaimed the Jew, starting back as he put down the candle. "'How pale you are!' "'Pale?' echoed the girl, shading her eyes with her hands, as if to look steadily at him. "'Quite horrible! What have you been doing to yourself?' "'Nothing that I know of, except sitting in this close place for I don't know how long and all,' replied the girl carelessly. "'Come, let me get back, that's a dear.' With a sigh for every piece of money, Fagin told the amount into her hand. They parted without more conversation, merely interchanging a good night. When the girl got into the open street, she sat down upon a doorstep, and seemed, for a few moments, wholly bewildered and unable to pursue her way. Suddenly she arose, and hurrying on, in a direction quite opposite to that in which Sykes was awaiting her return, quickened her pace until it gradually resolved into a violent run. After completely exhausting herself, she stopped to take breath, and, as if suddenly recollecting herself, and deploring her inability to do something she was bent upon, wrung her hands and burst into tears. It might be that her tears relieved her, or that she felt the full hopelessness of her condition, but she turned back, and hurrying with nearly as great rapidity in the contrary direction, partly to recover lost time, and partly to keep pace with the violent current of her own thoughts, soon reached the dwelling where she had left the housebreaker. If she betrayed any agitation, when she presented herself to Mr. Sykes, he did not observe it for merely inquiring if she had brought the money, and receiving a reply in the affirmative, he uttered a growl of satisfaction, and replacing his head upon the pillow, resumed the slumbers which her arrival had interrupted. It was fortunate for her that the possession of money occasioned him so much employment next day, in the way of eating and drinking, and withal had so beneficial an effect in smoothing down the asperities of his temper that he had neither time nor inclination to be very critical upon her behaviour and deportment. That she had all the abstracted and nervous manner of one who was on the eve of some bold and hazardous step, which it has required no common struggle to resolve upon, would have been obvious to the lynx-eyed Fagin, who would most probably have taken the alarm at once. But Mr. Sykes, lacking the niceties of discrimination, and being troubled with no more subtle misgivings than those which resolve themselves into a dogged roughness of behaviour towards everybody, and being furthermore in an unusually amiable condition, as has been already observed, saw nothing unusual in her demeanour, and indeed troubled himself so little about her, that, had her agitation been far more perceptible than it was, it would have been very unlikely to have awakened his suspicions. As that day closed in, the girl's excitement increased, and, when night came on, and she sat by, watching until the housebreaker should drink himself asleep, there was an unusual paleness in her cheek, and a fire in her eye, that even Sykes observed with astonishment. Mr. Sykes, being weak from the fever, was lying in bed, taking hot water with his gin to render it less inflammatory, and had pushed his glass towards Nancy to be replenished for the third or fourth time, when these symptoms first struck him. "'Why, burn my body!' said the man, raising himself on his hands as he stared the girl in the face. "'You look like a corpse come to life again. What's the matter?' "'Matter?' replied the girl. "'Nothing. What do you look at me so hard for?' "'What foolery is this?' demanded Sykes, grasping her by the arm and shaking her roughly. "'What is it? What do you mean?' "'What are you thinking of?' "'Of many things, Bill,' replied the girl, shivering, and as she did so, pressing her hands upon her eyes. "'But, Lord, what odds in that?' The tone of forced gaiety in which the last words were spoken seemed to produce a deeper impression on Sykes, and the wild and rigid look which had preceded them. "'I tell you what it is,' said Sykes, "'if you haven't caught the fever, and got it coming on now. There's something more than usual in the wind, 
and something dangerous, too. You're not a-going to—' "'No, damn! You wouldn't do that.' "'Do what?' asked the girl. "'There ain't,' said Sykes, fixing his eyes upon her, and muttering the words to himself. "'There ain't a stauncher-hearted gal going, or I'd have cut her throat three months ago. She's got the fever coming on, that's it.' Fortifying himself with this assurance, Sykes drained the glass to the bottom, and then, with many grumbling oaths, called for his physic. The girl jumped up with great alacrity, poured it quickly out, but with her back towards him, and held the vessel to his lips while he drank off the contents. "'Now,' said the robber, "'come and sit aside of me, and put on your own face, or I'll alter it so that you won't know it again when you do want it.' The girl obeyed. Sykes, locking her hand in his, fell back upon the pillow, turning his eyes upon her face. They closed, opened again, closed once more, again opened. He shifted his position restlessly, and, after dozing again and again for two or three minutes, and as often springing up with a look of terror, and gazing vacantly about him, was suddenly stricken, as it were, while in the very attitude of rising, into a deep and heavy sleep. The grasp of his hand relaxed. The upraised arm fell languidly by his side, and he lay like one in a profound trance. "'The laudanum has taken effect at last,' murmured the girl, as she rose from the bedside. "'I may be too late even now.' She hastily dressed herself in her bonnet and shawl, looking fearfully round from time to time, as if, despite the sleeping draught, she expected every moment to feel the pressure of Sykes' heavy hand upon her shoulder. Then, stooping softly over the bed, she kissed the robber's lips, and then opening and closing the room door with noiseless touch, hurried from the house. A watchman was crying half-past nine, down a dark passage through which she had to pass, in gaining the main thoroughfare. "'Has it long gone, the half-hour?' asked the girl. "'It'll strike the hour in another quarter,' said the man, raising his lantern to her face. "'And I cannot get there in less than an hour or more.' muttered Nancy, brushing swiftly past him, and gliding rapidly down the street. Many of the shops were already closing in the back lanes and avenues through which she tracked her way, in making from Spitalfields towards the west end of London. The clock struck ten, increasing her impatience. She tore along the narrow pavement, elbowing the passengers from side to side, and darting almost under the horses' heads, crossed crowded streets, where clusters of persons were eagerly watching their opportunity to do the like. "'The woman is mad,' said people, turning to look after her as she rushed away. When she reached the more wealthy quarter of the town, the streets were comparatively deserted, and here her headlong progress excited a still greater curiosity in the stragglers whom she hurried past. Some quickened their pace behind, as though to see whither she was hasting at such an unusual rate, and a few made head upon her and looked back, surprised at her undiminished speed. But they fell off one by one, and when she neared her place of destination, she was alone. It was a family hotel in a quiet but handsome street near Hyde Park. As the brilliant light of the lamp which burned before its door guided her to the spot, the clock struck eleven. She had loitered for a few paces as though irresolute, and making up her mind to advance, but the sound determined her, and she stepped into the hall. The porter's seat was vacant. She looked round with an air of incertitude, and advanced towards the stairs. "'Now, young woman,' said a smartly dressed female, looking out from a door behind her, "'what do you want here?' "'A lady who is stopping in this house,' answered the girl. "'A lady?' was the reply, accompanied with a scornful look. "'What lady?' "'Miss Maylie,' said Nancy. The young woman, who had by this time noted her appearance, replied only by a look of virtuous disdain, and summoned a man to answer her. To him Nancy repeated her request. "'What name am I to say?' asked the waiter. "'It's of no use saying any,' replied Nancy. "'Nor business?' said the man. "'No, nor that neither,' rejoined the girl. "'I must see the lady.' "'Come,' said the man, pushing her towards the door. "'None of this.' "'Take yourself off.' "'I shall be carried out if I go,' said the girl violently. "'And I can make that a job that two of you won't like to do. 
Isn't there anybody here? She said, looking round, that will see a simple message carried for a poor wretch like me. This appeal produced an effect on a good-tempered faced man cook, who with some of the other servants was looking on, and who stepped forward to interfere. Take it up for a joke, can't you? said this person. Oh, what's the good? replied the man. You don't suppose a young lady will see such as her, do you? This allusion to Nancy's doubtful character raised a vast quantity of chaste wrath in the bosoms of four housemaids, who remarked, with great fervour, that the creature was a disgrace to her sex, and strongly advocated her being thrown ruthlessly into the kennel. "'Do what you like with me,' said the girl, turning to the men again. "'But do what I ask you first, and I ask you to give this message for God Almighty's sake.' The soft-hearted cook added his intercession and the result was that the man who had first appeared undertook its delivery. "'What's it to be?' said the man, with one foot on the stairs. "'That a young woman earnestly asks to speak to Miss Maylie alone,' said Nancy, "'and that if the lady will only hear the first word she has to say, she will know whether to hear her business, or to have her turned out of doors as an impostor. "'I say,' said the man, "'you're coming it strong.' "'You give the message.' said the girl firmly, and let me hear the answer." The man ran upstairs. Nancy remained pale and almost breathless, listening with quivering lip to the very audible expressions of scorn, of which the chaste housemaids were very prolific, and of which they became still more so, when the man returned, and said the young woman was to walk upstairs. "'It's no good being proper in this world,' said the first housemaid. "'Brass can do better than the gold what has stood the fire.' said the second. The third contented herself with wondering what ladies was made of, and the fourth took the first in a quartet of shameful with which the Dianas concluded. Regardless of all this, for she had weightier matters at heart, Nancy followed the man, with trembling limbs, to a small antechamber, lighted by a lamp from the ceiling. Here he left her, and retired. End of chapter 39